Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love thy, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Oh, how I love, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. I was at a wedding a couple of weeks ago in Illinois. The wedding was held in an old church. I knew it was old because the woodwork in the place, you could not afford to do it these days. It would just be way too expensive to have that kind of work done in, a, in, a, in any kind of facility. But it was an old church, I think, better than 100 years old. I want to say the mid-1800s a thing was built. Um, an old church, but it was no longer a church. It was now a concert hall or something, that, something like that. They did sh music stuff in the thing. It always saddens me yeah. to see a building that used to preach the gospel and God's people met to meet with the Lord. It always saddens me to see a building being used like that, that being used for some other purpose. Now, I know that there's nothing spiritual about a building. I know that. But for some reason, when I see a church that is no longer being used for a church, it just makes me sad on the inside. But the fact of the matter is, there, buildings are not spiritual. There's no such thing as a spiritual church. Okay, this church consists of a building, a name, a constitution. It consists of pews and hymns and all these things. That's the building. But is there anything spiritual about those things? And the answer to that is no. But a church is comprised of people. But does the church make the people spiritual or vice versa? Do you see, just because a person attends here does not make them spiritual. The actual truth is, this, there is no such thing as a spiritual church. A church is only as spiritual as the temperature of the people who attend there. Yeah. So each individual person has his own spiritual temperature, his own spiritual growth. And you come to church bringing that with you. And as we gather together, the spiritualness of this church is determined by the cumulative total of everybody here. That means that when you come to church, you either increase or decrease the spiritual temperature of this church building, of this church meeting together. Does that make sense to you? Because there is no such thing as a spiritual church. There's only people. And you have your own spiritual temperature. Now, I don't know about you, but my desire is that Adelphi Calvary Baptist Church would be absolutely positively a spiritual place where people come and worship God with all their heart. That's what I desire for this place is that we come, and this is an absolutely positively spiritual environment where we worship God together. I desire that more than I could ever express. Okay, so how do we get to that point? Each person individually. That's how that happens. We can't just sit here and make the building spiritual. Each individual person sitting in the pew has got to work on their own relationship with God. And as you draw closer to the Lord individually, the spiritual temperature of this church raises yes. and becomes more positive in this community. This means that we each have to work on our own self. If we want this desire, if we desire this church to be what it ought to be, we must each strive in our own personal walk with the Lord that it would be what it can be. Now, we should each be able to say with David, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. But, let's be honest, it isn't always that way, is it? Isn't sometimes it's dry as dust and just as dead? If we allow that 
then our own spiritual temperature is going to drop. And if it drops, then the spiritual temperature of this church drops. And the effectiveness in the community drops. Our ability to worship drops. Therefore, we must make sure that our time spent with the Lord is as profitable as it can be. So tonight, just a couple of quick reminders. Improving the quality of your time with the Lord. Improving the quality of your time with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we need you to teach us. You know our shortcomings. You know the difficulties. You know where we're at. We just want you to teach us. Lead your little children into truth. We ask this in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Six quick points. <coughs> to improve the quality of your time with the Lord. Number one, allow enough time. Allow enough time. When Michelangelo painted the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, it took him four years. Now suppose Michael, and it's, an, it's a work of art, suppose when he showed up to start the job, the guy that hired him said, hey, look, we got a wedding here at 7 o'clock, so you need to get this thing done before then. What would the ceiling look like? Probably something like a far side cartoon on the ceiling. It would not be this work of art, because this is going to take some time. If you were going to bake a cake and enter it into the state fair, and I said, okay, here's the ingredients, you have three minutes to get this done. Do you expect to win a blue ribbon? You see, it takes time to do things and to do them right. And when you shorten that time up, the quality of it is diminished. Somehow we get the idea that if we can quick throw two or three minutes or 12 minutes at the Lord, then somehow our Christian life is just going to blossom into some amazing thing. My friend, it doesn't work that way. No way, nothing in life works that way. If it's going to blossom, it's going to have to have enough time put at it to make it what it needs to be. It needs to be the best time. It's got to be adequate time. It's got to be the best time. Usually this time is in the morning. When your mind is the sharpest and when the day hasn't got rolling yet. But you know what the problem with that is? Here, let me give you a real hint here. We generally blow our morning devotions the night before. Now, how do you do that? Well, you decide you want to stay up and read a little bit more of the book that you're reading, or you want to scan through Facebook one more time, you want to check email, you're going to finish watching this television show, and so you stay up later than you should. And then what happens in the morning? Your alarm rings, and so you hit the snooze button, and it rings again, and you're really tired because you stayed up a little too late, so you hit the snooze button again. And by the time you hit it that third time, you realize, i got to get to work. And so you jump out of bed, and you're running now, and so you quick do your devotions because you got to get them done before you go off to work. And actually, you ruined your time with the Lord the night before. Be careful of this. The devil does this to us because you're not thinking about your devotions the next morning. You're thinking about, oh, I feel like watching this, or I feel like doing this Facebook thing, or I feel like... And you blow your devotions, the quality of your devotions before you ever get to them. Don't let the devil do that to you. You've got to spend quality time. It's got to be in the, uh, the right time, the best time of the day. Give him the best time of the day. Give him enough time that you don't feel like you're rushed. Make sure you clear the area of distraction. We talked about this last week, but make sure that you clear that area of distraction. Your phone, the radio, the TV, the iPad, the computer are all killers of your time with the Lord. Also, in this time, make sure that you don't make it too comfortable. You ever notice how groggy your mind gets, especially when you wake up early in the morning and you're sitting there and you get real comfortable in your easy chair, and the next thing you know, your mind just kind of zones out. Don't get too comfortable, or your quality, the quality of the time that you spend with the Lord is going to diminish. Make sure that you give it enough time. Number two, don't lock yourself into a routine. We talked about this last week as well, but don't lock yourself into routine. When, you, when your time with the Lord becomes routine, it loses a lot of his effectiveness. You'll start trying to get through the sequence of events 
as opposed to spending time with the Lord. I'm going to read this, I'm going to read the daily bread, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to pray. And you become trying to get your list done instead of actually spending time with the Lord. So don't let yourself get into a rut. Generally, when I study in the morning, spend time with the Lord, I, I have two or three books that I read all, I, that I have going at any given time. And they'll be all from easy to read to some that takes your entire brain and then some to make, to make sense of. So I have two or three different books going at the same time. And when I sit down in the morning, I'll ask the Lord, which one do you want me to read this morning? Wh wh where am I going to learn here? And so I let the Lord determine. He may say, don't read any of those today. But I let the Lord kind of work through that. Don't get it, I'm going to read four chapters of this, and then I'm going to do... Don't get caught into a rut. Let the Lord lead in these things. There, you should be reading some other reading. Um, but make sure that you let the Lord be in charge of that. When you read your Bible, have a pen and paper handy. You can be surprised. Just that one act will, will change your Bible reading. If you'll sit there with a pen in your hand and a paper right there, expecting God to give you something, you'll find that he does. If you're not expecting God to give you anything, you're not prepared to write it down even if he did, more than likely you won't get anything. But if you sit there with a pen in your hand expecting God to teach you something from his word, more than likely you will learn something. It's not the amount of, of the word that you chew through. When I was in college, I took an Old Testament survey class. They gave us the course syllabus at the beginning, and it said one of the course requirements is we had to read through the Old Testament that semester. Now, a lot of the kids in the class had actually never read through the Old Testament. I, had, I started reading the Bible through when I was in the seventh grade. And so I'd read the Bible through every year since I was in the seventh grade. So it was, there was no new information here for me. So I determined that this is not, I'm not doing this for spiritual reason. I've, I got to get this done. I got to get, because I knew it was going to be a busy semester. So I read the entire Old Testament and it was less than, it was just over a week, under two weeks. I read the entire Old Testament. I actually had some of it on cassette back in the day, and we were listening to it as we went to work. One of the kids was complaining that my car had a carbon monoxide leak. It was, it was diesel, which you can't do that, but he was complaining it had a carbon monoxide leak. He says, every time I get in your car, I fall asleep. Well, the book of Leviticus could do that to you. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, look, I read through the whole Old Testament in like seven, eight, nine days. Did I get anything from it? No, I got the class, the, fulfill the requirements of the class, but there was no spiritual value to that. Don't be in a race. It's not how much, I look, I got the whole thing done in eight days. Does that do anything for me? No, neither if you get 25 chapters done in a day and you don't learn anything, then you didn't accomplish anything. Okay, it's not the point to see how far you can get. It is that you are spending quality time to, with the Lord. Don't go speeding. Uh, the goal is to be impacted, to be taught, to be changed. Don't let your prayer be reduced to a list. Now, I'm not against praying using a list, but don't let it be reduced to a list. I said all of these things. That's my prayer. I, I mentioned every name here. Okay, that is using vain repetition or the next thing to it. When you're praying... Speak to the Lord. Now, you may use a list to prompt your mind, but speak to the Lord. It's not merely the mentioning of their name that makes prayer prayer. Spend time with the Lord. Make sure that it is quality time. Don't let yourself get into a rut. Number three, realize the absolute need of the Holy Spirit. Realize the absolute need of the Holy Spirit. I think in some circles this is beginning to change. But for the very longest time, many of God's people gave up the Holy Spirit. You never heard him talked about in our churches and so forth. One of the devil's tactics was to take the Holy Spirit from us. What amazing good strategy that was. What is the Christian life without the Holy Spirit? There is nothing without the Holy Spirit. You can't learn anything. You can't know anything. There's no traction. There's no power without the Holy Spirit. And when you go to your devotions, realize the absolute need of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this without Him. Without the Spirit, all you have is the flesh. And what does that do for you? 
breeds corruption. That is not what you're looking for in your devotions. Realize the absolute need of the Holy Spirit. Look, when I, I've started Meyer Hall, I almost always start my classes this way these days. You've got a whole group of guys and they have no clue about the Lord or any of that. And I said, look, I'm here to teach tonight. But the fact of the matter is, I cannot teach you this. If I was in shop class, I could teach you how to use power tools. But here, I cannot, t- I'll be the lead this Bible study, but I can't teach you this. This is God's book and he's got to teach it to you. So, in order for anything to happen here, God's got to teach you. Now, how's he going to teach you? How do you start? And I tell, look, if you want to do business with God, he always deals in truth. So you've got to get honest. If you're going to do any business with God right now, you've got to be honest. Now, if the honest truth is, and this is what I tell him, if the honest truth is you don't know God exists, then that's what you ought to tell him. Because he already knows that, and now you're getting honest with him. He's not going to leave you there. He's going to move you forward. But if you don't believe he exists, then you ought to tell him that. Because that, at least, is the honest thing, and then he'll, he'll work. So get honest with the Lord, and then let him move you forward. This is what we ought to do. This is what you ought to do. When you sit down to your devotions, you need to get honest. What is the actual truth? Now, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin then how can you expect him to teach you any more than what he's already taught you? If you're not willing to listen to that, then why would he teach you anything else? So deal with the sin. Get honest with the Lord. Say, that's what I'm doing, and I've got to quit that. You've got to get honest with the Lord and let the Spirit of God deal with whatever sin that you're knowing about. You've got to deal with that. Because your devotions, your time with the Lord is going to be complete. That's it. You're, that's as far as you're going to go. Because he's already told you something. And there's no need to tell you more until you do that. So, deal with any sin. And then ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. Do you realize you cannot learn anything spiritual apart from the Holy Spirit? You could read your Bible a thousand times. In fact, there are guys who have met Bible completely memorized who don't believe any of it. Look, apart from the Holy Spirit, this book has no power for you. And if you're going to learn it, he's got to teach it to you. So realize, when you sit down for your devotions, apart from the the Spirit, I've got nothing. So make sure there's nothing hindering him teaching you, and make sure that you ask him to teach you from this book. Realize the absolute need of the Holy Spirit. Number four, if your mind wanders, just go right back. It's a trick of the devil uh, to get our mind to wander. It doesn't take much of a trick, does it? <laughs> For mine, my mind just... That's why I try to remove as many distractions from my area because, you know, that, the whole thing, rabbit, you know, rabbit, that, that whole thing. So I try to remove as much of that as I can. But my mind finds its own little rabbit trails. That's one of the tricks of the devil. But that's not the main trick here. You know what the real trick is? After, when you realize that you've just rabbit trailed, to get you to beat yourself up over it. Because every second that you spend beating yourself up over rabbit trailing is one more second you don't spend with the Lord. So he gets you to rabbit trail, and then he gets you to, to rabbit trail on the rabbit trail. When what you really ought to do is go back to the Lord and say, I'm sorry, I let my mind wander. Please draw my mind to yourself. Yes. Just go right back. Don't spend all your time running around the circle wondering why you let your mind wander. Just bring it right back to the Lord and ask Him to set his, your mind on Himself. If your mind wanders, just go right back. Number eight, or, or number five, work at meditating. Work at meditating. You know, the Bible is not like a comic book or a novel. You just can't blow through it like you speed read another book. It was not meant to be read that way. You know, the Bible was meant to be thought upon and chewed upon. It was meant to be meditated. That's how it was written. And so when you read it, you have to read it that way. You can't just read it like you do another normal book. It wasn't written that way. It was written to have to be chewed on, to be meditated on. So read it that way. Read it to get, read the verse to get an overview. Where's this thing going? Then bring it back and reread it. Take one phrase at a time. The Bible's not like any other book. Sometimes you have to take it and break it down one phrase at a time. 
what is this phrase actually saying here? So you take it, you look at the overview of where's this thing kind of going, and then you look at each phrase. Now you may have to go down to one word. What does this word actually mean, and why are they using this word that way? Now if you have trouble with that, I mentioned this in Sunday school this morning. Let me encourage you to use your technology. Uh, Carol, I have to tell you, the app that I use, there's a, it's a Bible. You get the, it's all free, but they have the Bible, but it's got all of the Strong's numbers in it. So all the words that are actually, the, the, all the words have, are underlined. If you click on the word, it brings up the Strong's concordance and tells you the word, the definition, how it's used, where it's all used, how it's been translated. It's all free, and it's very easy because you just click that thing, and up it pops. Use technology, technology throws us under the bus about half the time, but there is positive use for technology. So if you have trouble with some of the words, then have that right there so you can just click on it and bring it up and find out what does this word actually mean? You can't just pass over it. The Bible was meant to be meditated on, to be thought over, to figure out what is this actually saying. As you're reading it, pray for insight and record the truth that you learn. You spend, when you learn something, if you find something about God, then take time and thank Him about that truth about Himself. Do you realize that God bent down and saw fit to teach you something personally about Himself? Isn't that amazing? God Himself bent down and taught you something about Himself, you personally. That, my friend, is worthy of saying, thank you, Father, for teaching me that truth. So make it a time of worship as you read. He reveals the word and you bring it back to him. Thank you for being that kind of a God. Thank you for teaching truth. Write it down because, you know, if you're like me, your mind forgets it about ten minutes after you wrote it. Write it down. It'll be a blessing to you down in the, in the, in the future as you review those things. Work at meditating. And number six, lastly here, choose to believe what you read. Choose to believe what you read. I don't know about you, but anytime I read anything anymore, I read it with a question mark. When an email comes through, I read it with a question mark. If you see it on Facebook, I look at it with a question mark. If I see it on the news, I, read, I look at it with a question mark. If I hear it on the radio, it's a question mark. Everything I read these days is a question mark. Why? Because there's a lot of people who lie out there. There's a lot of mistruth. There's a lot of <laughs> all of this mess. And people don't mind dealing in lies. But if you bring that thought to the scriptures, you're on the wrong page. When you come to the scriptures, you choose already to believe whatever you're going to read. This is what it says, and that is the way that it is. You must choose to believe what you read. The Bible was not written as a suggestion, and it was not written to be questioned. It was written to be believed. So you look for, state, for things to believe. Look for statements about God. He tells you about himself, and believe that's exactly the way he is. Look for things that he, statements that he makes about life. This is the way life is. When he makes it, that's the way it is. Choose to believe that is exactly the way it is. When he makes promises, choose to believe this is actually the way that it is. Insist on believing exactly what you read. You know what? God loves to be trusted. He loves to be believed. So many people in the world are not believing God. And he loves to be trusted. And he pours out blessings on those who will trust him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He loves to be trusted. So when you're reading, choose to believe this is the way that it is. And I'm going to live my life like that is the exact way that it is, because it actually is, my friend. But choose to believe it. Don't let there be any question marks. This is exactly the way it is, because this is exactly what God says. Look, we want this church to be as strong spiritual truth is. 
the, the truth. The, sorry, we want this church to be a strong spiritual church. The reality is that will mostly be determined by tomorrow morning. When we get up and sit with our time with the Lord, when we skip it, well, there goes part of the strength, the spiritual strength of the church. When we quick get it done, we are diminishing. But when we spend quality time with our God every single day, when we come back here on a Sunday or on a Wednesday to worship God, this place will ring with love for our Savior. That is what we desire. And that's going to take place when you get up in the morning, how you spend that quality time with your God. Father.